So we applied this first order analysis, right? This h of s being h0 plus h1 tau s over 1 plus tau s expression several times. Now we will apply it one more time to something else to see some, an important effect. So we will apply it again to the common uh, source stage, right? The common source stage with res source resistance R1 in general and a load resistance R2. This is V in and V out. But this time we want to see what is the imp input impedance in the presence of a, so the input impedance R in, uh, in the presence of just C mu. Because in the presence of C mu, this should be a first order response, right? First order. So we are interested in Z in more accurately, right? Z in. So we could calculate Z in from here. So this would be the Z in. But we could also calculate Z in from here and add R1 to it, whatever that is, right? So again, we'll do the easier thing. So we'll stare, say, look, I am interested in this Z in. So I'll try to calculate the intrinsic part of it. And if I try to calculate the intrinsic part of it, this is the way it will look like. So to calculate this Z in, I can do a different input impedance. I can do it. We can do, apply it different, different ways, right? You can use two different kinds of sources. I can apply, we can apply a current source or a voltage source. So which one do you think makes life, my life easier if to, to apply in terms of this calculation? So what we are trying to calculate is the input impedance here, right? Which one do you, makes it, do you think makes it easier? Applying a current source or a voltage source? A voltage source appears to make it easier. But then, if I'm applying a voltage source, I have to be careful. Because what am I calculating if I'm applying a voltage source? An impedance. An, an admittance, sorry. An, an, an admittance, right? So, yes, that's fine. Apply a voltage source, Vx, and measure Ix. But what we are really calculating is y of s, not z of s. So let's do that calculation. So, so if you want to calculate y of s, again, our method tells us that you need to calculate y0. What is y0? y0 is when the source is basically, when, when, what, what you see when the capacitance is 0, right? When the capacitance is 0, or 0 valued, or open circuited, what is the admittance you see here? What is the impedance or resistance? What is the resistance you see here? If the capacitance is gone, it's infinity, right? So what is the conductance? Zero. zero. So y0, y0 would be zero, right? How about y mu, which is basically when c mu is infinite valued? When you infinite value it, what do you see? You short circuit this thing. Again, you have a current source whose current is proportional to its voltage. It's Rm parallel R2. But Rm parallel R2 is basically, that's the resi resistance. In conductances, that would be Gm. Oh. That's Gm plus 1 over R2, right? Because conductances add in parallel. So, and then, let's make this better looking. Uh, now, and then there's one more thing we need to calculate. We need to calculate the tau. Right? Tau. What is tau? Or, 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 or for calculating a tau, we need to calculate R mu zero. Right? So we need to null the independent source. Nulling this would result in a short circuit on this side. So this side becomes ground. So you have to see what's the resistance you see across here. Now, when you short circuit this, what happens to GM? What happens to, no, well, not GM, GM V pi, this current source. What happens to V pi? If I short circuit it, V pi is 0. So this is 0. So it becomes open circuit. So this doesn't exist either. Right? And as a result, you, what's the resistance? What is the resistance that you see? Just R2, right? Because this doesn't exist. It's just R2. So you can see that you have three simple parameters. So now what is the admittance? y of s, so y of s is y0 
H0, which is 0. So you only get this term. So you have Gm plus 1 over R2 times R2 times C mu S divided by R1 plus R2 C mu S. Right? This R2 cancels that, so you get C mu 1 plus Gm R2 uh, S in the, denom in the numerator and 1 plus R2 C mu S. So what we are interested in is the input impedance, right? So if I just want to calculate the impedance, now that I've calculated y, if you want to calculate the impedance, you can flip it, right? You can just invert it. So I know z of s is going to be, by definition, 1 over y of s, so which becomes this thing. So you can write it as two separate terms, 1 over 1 plus gm r2 c mu s plus uh, this thing, plus R2. So now, what is the, if you divide this by that, the second term, when you invert it, C mu cancels, right? So you see R2 over 1 plus Gm R2, uh, and S cancels too, right? So basically what you're left with is some sort of a, some resistance. Now, and if, and if this resistance is if GMR2, which is the gain of the system, right? This is the gain of the stage, is l much larger than 1, what does it reduce to? Because if this, system, this has sufficient gain, this is the gain, right, of this common source stage, GMR2. If this gain is substantially larger than 1, this becomes roughly GMR2, so it becomes R2 over GMR2 becomes RM. So this is roughly 1 over 1 plus GM R2 C mu S plus Rm. This is the exact, if, if you were concerned about the exact. OK, fine. But what does this equation tell us? It tells us something very interesting and important. A couple of actually important and interesting things. One is that looking into this guy, looking into the gate of this stage, you see what? You see a serious combination of a capacitor, so the equivalent resistance here, the input of that thing looks like a capacitor and a resistor to ground. So this is the equivalent circuit for Zn. Right? And the resistor is roughly Rm. More accurately, actually, it's Rm parallel. If you look at this, this is Rm parallel with R, R2. Right? Because you multiply it by Rm, denominator and numerator. So that's the parallel combination of two. So, so let's write it that way. Let's say Rm in parallel with R2, roughly Rm. This is very interesting. You are looking into the gate of the stage, right? that DC is open, but you see a combination of a resistor and a capacitor. Now, this is something that most of the textbooks and most of the things do not talk about. And it's very important. Because a lot of these things are shown as just purely the capacitor part, which, we'll, which we see, as we see is not accurate. And why, this is, why is this important? Because, for example, in RF circuitry, if you're trying to do power matching to the input of a MOSFET, you may think, a matching to a capacitor. If you want to do conjugate matching to a capacitor, it will not happen, right? I mean, it's just basically you cannot conjugate match to, the, match to a capacitor because there's no resistive part. But what you're really matching to is this thing. You should be matching to this resistor. So you have, you have this complex impedance that you're matching to. And that's the resistive part of it that's important. Now, the capacitive part of it is also quite important. So let's, let's look at the capacitive part of it. So what, does, what is the value of this cap equivalent capacitor? 1 gm r2 cn, right? So it's 1 plus gm r2 c mu. Right? Let's call this c capital M. 
right? We'll call it C capital M. What is this quantity? The gain of the states, right? So this is, well, it's really the negative the gain. So it's really 1 minus the gain. So mu, you can also show it as 1 plus absolute magnitude value of the gain. What happened to C mu? C mu generally can be a small capacitor. That's an overlap capacitor, right? But now it got multiplied at the input by a factor of 1 plus the gain. This, is, this can potentially be a large factor, right, if you have a large gain. So your capacitance appears 1 plus a times greater at its input than, its, than the output. Than, than where it was, right? So it, you, you see a much larger capacitor here. Why? And, well, this can be a useful thing or a bad thing, depending on what you're trying to do, right? It can be a bad thing if you're trying to get something that has high frequency response, because then you have a gigantic capacitor in the input. And then, for example, with com in com combination with this R1, that equivalent capacitance can kill your gain, because it's like a low-pass filter with a large capacitor. So that's a bad thing. Now, when can it be a good thing? For example, if you're trying to create a you need a large capacitor somewhere right, on your circuit, and this capacitance is not uh, it, it would be prohibitive in terms of making it on the chip because the area that it would take would be large, right? right? What you can do, you can take a small capacitor and multiply it by this factor of 1 plus k to appear much larger so you can actually shrink the size of the actual capacitor that you need to make. So once you're aware of what it does, it's an important thing. Now, this kind of multiplication, though, I mean, why is it happening? What's happening here? So let's think about that a little bit more, in, a little bit more subtly, in more detail. So imagine that you have an ideal amplifier. So an ideal amplifier in the sense that you have an amplifier whose output impedance, so, so it's, let's say, you have a dependent voltage source inside this box, and it's, it's basically A, it has a voltage gain of whatever, Vn, so whatever comes in, you have an AV. So you have an input, V in, with respect to ground. And then, so this is the V in, and this is the V out. And now let's imagine that you have an impedance here connected across its output from Z, right? Some impedance connected between its input and output. So um, let's call that, yeah, Z1. So what's happening? Let's start with the capacitor. Let's start with the capacitor first. Just, just assume that it's a capacitor here, C1, right? So let's say you have a large inverting gain, meaning that your input and output are put going in opposite directions. So what happens when your input goes up by some value? So let's say delta V. So let's say your input moves up by delta V. What would the output do? The output, if it's the negative, the gain is negative, will go down by AV delta V, right? By a large amount. So what has happened for, to the voltage across this capacitor? The voltage across the capacitor has, is increasing by a factor of 1 plus a absolute value of AV, right? right? So this delta V here is basically 1 plus absolute value of AV right, across the capacitor. So the capacitor sees a voltage swing across itself that's 1 plus AV times greater. What would this result in? It would result in a current that is 1 plus AV times larger than if the capacitor was connected here. So what, what's really happening is this. So you have a, let's see. OK, so I have this. So let's say this is the input, and this is the output, right? And this is like the gain. Right? I'm moving it a little bit here. So I'm moving this up. The, the other side goes down a lot. 
So the voltage across the capacitor changes a lot. It draws a lot of current. So it makes it look, it makes it draw the current of a capacitor that's this much larger. This is called Miller effect. So he described, he had a paper in 1920 with vacuum tubes that describes this effect. It's called Miller multiplication. So you push this up, this goes down a lot. Now the larger the gain is, the more the other side moves, right? For a given, so, and then this multiplication of this capacitance becomes larger. That's what was happening in that stage. In general, if you have an impedance Z here, so let's go back to that impedance Z1, right? If you have an impedance Z1 here, so what is the voltage swing across Z1? The voltage swing across Z1 has increased by a factor of that. So the current through Z1 is a factor of 1 plus uh, absolute value of a, AV greater, which basically, or 1 minus AV because AV is negative, greater. So the impedance at the input, Z in, is Z1 divided by that factor because its current is this, by this factor larger. So the impedance gets divided by this factor at the input. So if I ask, then, then you may say, well, why did the capacitor go up by this factor? Because capacitance, imp the impedance of a capacitance is 1 over CS. So if the impedance goes down by a factor, the capacitance has gone up by the same factor because it's inversely proportional, right? Now, this actually is interesting because it can do all sorts of interesting things. So another way to think about it is that if you have this Z1 here, think about this pivot point on this, on this right? If this, this fulcrum, right, the point that it's basically moving up and down. It appears that if I had this fulcrum, if, I, if there was a fulcrum, I could break my impedance into two parts. I could show this impedance, I could split it into some sort of so some value, let's say some two pieces, and say this middle point doesn't move, right? So if my original impedance was Z, well sorry, let's say it was Z to begin with, then this becomes Z1 and this becomes Z minus Z1, right? These two still add to Z. Let's say the original impedance was Z. And this is Z1. But now if I remember, I have an impedance, what side, a resistor, one side of it is going in one direction, the other side of it is going in the other direction. So there is a point in the middle that doesn't move, right? At least at one frequency, right? So there will be a point, and I define that point as the pivot point, and that point, since it doesn't move by substitution theorem, I can do what to that point? Ground it, right? So if I ground this point, this to this point, then I have really split the circuit into something, an impedance Z1 at the input. And what needs to happen is that the current through this, there should be no current flowing through this ground, right? So the current through here and the current through this should be the same, which basically means that delta V over Z1 has to be equal to this voltage, which is negative delta V, negative AV times delta V divided by Z minus Z1, right? Because those two currents have to be equal. This is the current, I. And if that's the case, you can basically cancel the AVs. And what do you get? You get, um, so you get Z minus Z1 equals negative AV Z1. Therefore, you can move this one to the other side. You get 1 minus AV. Z1 equals Z, therefore Z1 is Z divided by 1 minus AV, which is what we intuitively said here, right? So you can see that the impedance is scaled down by 1 minus AV, according to this. Now, and then you can say, okay, look, if I had an ideal amplifier like that, 
I can actually split it into, um, I can split the impedance into two pieces. And I can show them, I can basically, instead of putting them there, I can put them here. I can say there's an input impedance here, Z1, and then there's an impedance on the output, which is completely inconsequential to the rest of the circuit in this example. Why? Yes. Now, you have basically an ideal voltage source attached across it, right? It's connected across an ideal voltage source, so it doesn't really matter from, for in this example when it's idealized. But it, that's what it would be there. So that's great. So, fine. so if you have inverting gain, this happens. What if you have non-inverting gain? You could, that's a possible scenario, right? So let's say you have non-inverting gain that's smaller than 1. It's non-inverting. It's positive. But it's, not, it's less than 1. Gain. Okay. So what happens to this picture now? Now, instead of this going opposite direction. When I pull this up, the other side goes up and down, but at a lower rate. So when I'm going up and down, the, other, the, out, the output is moving in the same direction. So what happens to the current across the capacitor? The voltage across the capacitor is actually now smaller. So, or if in general in, an impedance, the voltage across the impedance is smaller. So what you should expect to see is that the impedance actually becomes larger, which would be the case if this is non-negative and smaller than 1. Right? And so basically, the impedance becomes smaller. Uh, oh, the, the, the impedance becomes larger. Sorry. The impedance becomes larger, because this becomes smaller than 1. And, but if it, the impedance was a particular capacitor, it, it becomes sm appears smaller, because it's sort of inversely proportional. What if the gain is exactly 1? Right, so it's hap this is what's going to happen, right? The input and output move together. The voltage across the capacitor or the, the impedance is none, it, it's zero, right? It's, it doesn't exist. It's always constantly zero. There's no voltage. There's n now, and therefore, the impedance goes to infinity. Means that it's not there. It becomes open circuit. Or the capacitance goes to zero. Right? So this is actually one way to get rid of capacitors. If you have some annoying capacitor, there's some places that you can actually do this. If there's a capacitor that's annoying you, if you drive the other side of the capacitor at the same voltage, then you can make the effect of that capacitance to disappear. Now, the interesting stuff happens, really interesting stuff happens, as you can imagine, if this AV was positive and greater than 1. What do you get then? Negative impedance. Negative impedance. You can get the negative resistance, actually, if you get again. Why do you get negative resistance? Because think about it. This is the scenario. Right? So this voltage is going up, but the current is coming back because the other side of it is going even higher. So the current flows backwards towards me. When I, when I raise a voltage, instead of more current going in, more current comes back my way. That's by definition negative resistance, right? So this is one way to make a negative resistance. If you have a positive gain more than one. Now, negative resistances can be very useful or very dangerous, depending on how you use them. So you need to know, it's like playing with fire. Fire can be useful or dangerous, depending on how you use it. Um, OK. So those are some scenarios that you can have. Now, there's one subtlety I want to talk about at the end of this conversation, because it is important before we wrap this up, which is the fact that this impedance, um, this calculation, is, this, is, oh, this calculation is only true if this was, there was no source impedance here. right? Now, this becomes an approximation if there's some impedance there. Because then this gain, this gain is not independent of frequency. The assumption here, the implicit assumption was that this gain is in, in, independent of frequency. If this gain is dependent on frequency, then it becomes a problem. It, so this is not an exact calculation. Now, there is this thing that some people refer to. Sometimes you may hear this term Miller theorem. There is no such thing as Miller theorem, or if there is in general, it is 
wrong. So this is the way Miller's Miller theorem goes. This is the way, the, present the way it's presented. They say, well, let's imagine the network. Somewhere in this network of elements, there is an element, or, or you have to be careful about how you define the theorem. Let's put it this way. It may not be necessarily wrong. So there's an impedance z, right? They say, OK, well, and this is voltage v1, and this is voltage v2. We say the current going through this one is clearly v1 minus v2 over z, right? But what if I could replace this with a with two impedances to ground, z1 and z2. And I want to force these two currents to be the same. So if this current was i, I make this current i and I make this current i, right? So I pick, so, so what, what would, would need to happen? So this is v1 and this is v2. So if I say v1 over z1 and this is equal to negative v2 over z2, right? Those are those currents, right? Um, so then I should be fine, right? Now, if I divide both sides of this thing, so if I take this, for example, and divide it by both sides by v1, I'll get 1 minus v2 over v1 divided by, and then um, z uh, equals 1 over z1. Now it can say, look, wait a second, this is gain. This is the gain between this node and that node. So if I say this is the gain, if I define this ratio as AV, then you can clearly see that it says Z1 equals Z divided by 1 minus AV. And you say, well, what's the problem? You got the same result. And there's another, you can do the same thing for the output. You can say Z2, then it's going to be the similar calculation here and there. So what you will end up with is that you will end up as 1 minus AV divided by Z equals negative AV divided by Z2. And then you can solve for this Z2. And what you will get is negative 1 over, or, or get rid of the negative, 1 over 1 minus 1 over AV uh, times Z. OK? So the, 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 it says, look, if I make the currents the same and the voltages are the same, how would the rest of the circuit know that this happened? Right? So that's the argument. That, yeah, sure, that should be OK. So what's the problem with this argument? That's exactly, that's one of the assumptions that's, that's problematic. We are assuming that that's some sort of a constant. That that's what's different between this and here. Here, this is enforced by this dependent source. So this was correct. But if you don't enforce that, it would be some value that would itself be frequency dependent in general. Now you may come back and say, well, if I calculate that frequency dependent thing and plug it in there, then it is correct. And I would say, yes, but it, it is correct, but it's useless at that point. So it's not a theorem if you want it, it would be useful if it were a parameter that was a constant or something that was easily calculated. But if you have to do the entire transfer function first, calculate the entire transfer function, and then plug it in there to get this result, then you will get what you get. So, and to demonstrate this, how it can break down, let's use this example. If I have the circuit with that R1, in place, right? Now, if I apply the so-called, the quote-unquote Miller theorem to this, what would it do? What would the, it convert the circuit to? If I use the GMRL, what happens is that if I just apply the gain, just GM, the low frequency gain, then it turns the circuit into this. A capacitor at the input, which would be the CM, right? with the source, whatever that is. Then you have this guy. You have R2. And then you will get a second capacitor, right, from this calculation, some other capacitor, C prime. 
right? So look at these two. If these, this was the equivalent circuit, you've taken a first order circuit, right? That had one pole and one zero, right? We, 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 we analyze this. It had one pole and one zero, a right half plane zero and left half plane pole. We saw that because the H1 and H0 are different polarities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it turned it into a second order circuit with no zeros. Because if you short the circuit, either one of them, the gain goes to zero. So you have to be very careful about how you apply this or if you apply it that way. The good thing about the method we developed in general is that it's not limited by those. I mean, the time constant calculation, that, this analysis is always correct. And the generalized form of that, which is the TTCs, is also correct all the time. Now, Miller effect is an important thing to understand. The effect of when you have one side going in one direction and the other side having a large gain, the current getting 1 plus 8 times larger, therefore the impedance is becoming 1 plus 8 times smaller, or a capacitance becoming 1 plus 8 times larger at the input, that's a very useful thing, that's a very useful effect. And the, the, the interesting thing is that Miller himself, in the paper, did not have a theorem. He described an effect and why it happened. Anyway, that's just the source of common confusion a lot of times, so just be careful about that. And, and so, so that should give you some, at least some insight into that. Any questions? 